Hi, everyone. Welcome to our panel, uh, where we're going to talk about one of the critical and pressing issues facing the global economy, Brexit and the impact on Europe. So just to bring everyone up to speed on the timeline, next week, January 31st, the EU will, leave, will lose, for the first time ever, one of its members from 28 to 27, with the UK leaving, second biggest economy. And we have a pretty diverse as diverse as it gets, two Germans and two Italians, to talk about what it's all going to mean for Europe. The 11th month shot clock starts, and they have to figure out some sort of trade deal between Europe and the UK. And so today we're going to talk about that and what it's all going to mean. I'd like to introduce our very esteemed <coughs> panelists here. We've got Paolo Gentiloni. He is the former prime minister of Italy. He's currently the commissioner for the economy at the European Commission. Welcome to you. We've got Frank uh, Apple. He is the CEO of Deutsche Post, DHL. We've got Christian Saving. He's the CEO of Deutsche Bank. And we've got Roberto Gualtieri, the Minister of the Economy and Finance in Italy. So thank you all for joining the discussion. And I always prefer in the round because it's a lot more fun and we'll have a lot more debate. I'd like to kick it off with you, Commissioner, as far as Europe's concern, what are going to be the key priorities in negotiating this very complex deal over the next year for Britain to leave as far as it relates to the economy and trade? Uh, yes. I would say first uh, to try to give uh, certainty uh, on, on to, to the process. I think in the last uh, couple of years we had, uh, we were rather uncertain on the outcome. Uh, now, um, the outcome is certain. We don't like it, but it is there. Uh, UK will leave the Union at the end of the month. Uh, we have a very short time for negotiation. 11 months for a free trade agreement is really very short if we look to other free trade agreements. But the European Union is ready to do uh, all is in our power to have the uh, more uh, uh, the best possible relation with UK. I would say that um, most of the results depend on the decision of the UK government. To tell it in, other, in another way, uh, if the UK government wants to have um, very uh, large access to the single market, uh, if they want to, uh, to have a very good relation with the single market, we are ready to, to do this. But it is not to us to decide. We have our rules. Uh, we expect a level playing field from this agreement. If there is an availability from the UK government, I think we will reach a good agreement. It is not easy in 11 months, but I think it is still possible. Uh, we can't have uh, zero uh, tariffs uh, and uh, dumping together. We, we, we can have zero tariffs and zero dumping. So we need an agreement with a level playing field between us, among us. What do you think, Minister Gualtieri, is the most important aspect as far as Italy is concerned in, in these negotiations? And what do you think are going to be the biggest sticking points? I think it's the balance between uh, the deepness of the free trade agreement, its comprehensiveness, and also the capacity to ensure a level playing field. Because at the end of the day, uh, a deeper comprehensive free trade agreement is not a single market. Equivalence is not passported. There are different things. So, we first want uh, a deal which is as much as possible, uh, deep and comprehensive, but we know <coughs> that an FTA is not a single market. So that will be, in any case, change. There will be differences. So first, it's important to, to, to not to lose time because, uh, you know, if the UK, as they have said, uh, is not going to use the option to prolong the transition, they already told us that, we have really short time. So we need to move quickly to define the principles, to focus on the most important things. It seems to be an FTA focus on goods, zero quota, zero tariffs is the magic formula, and level playing field, because you need this, internal and external security, and that would be what can be realistically done. 
and uh, that will uh, hopefully minimize at the maximum the disruption and we will have change that we have supply chains integrated on goods industrial production so that's not a minor thing so we want of course to minimize this as much as possible and on the financial markets as much as possible we will make a, an intelligent use of equivalence but it is not the same than single market so europe uh, if on the one hand has to negotiate in good faith uh, with the uk a good agreement that's also to prepare itself for a change which will be, especially in the medium term, deep. And so that means our agenda on capital market union, on banking union, on how to relaunch growth, on how to deepen our single market. So it's an ambitious agenda that we have we, to relaunch with even more determination because of Brexit. How hard are your lives planning for all of this with the uncertainty out there and the fact that we don't know if there's going to be a deal, we don't know what's going to be in the deal. This uncertainty has now been dragged out for years. How do you make it work for business? Yeah, so, so maybe first of all, you know, the Brexit has never been a good idea and still not a good idea. And what has happened so far <laughs> is just um, that it's off the top lines of the news, which is good news, actually, because that gives the UK and the European Union the chance to negotiate without constant public pressure what's going on. That's what has happened so far. We still have the opportunity that there's a hard Brexit. Because the hard Brexit would mean that we don't get an agreement and then the UK will be treated as a WTO country. Uh, and that is because the WTO says that they, we can't have a preferred deal with the UK. And that is still the risk. Um, it will be not as bad as people might think either. So we are preparing for ourselves for a long time also for a hard Brexit. It's less likely but we are well prepared to help our customers. How do you prepare? You know, of course, you are looking into contingency plannings. You are looking into driver's licenses for extra people, for customs clearance, for extra space, all that we have done already. So it costs us more money than it takes now longer. Um, but we are still hoping that we get to an agreement. But it's not off the table yet. What is good is it's off the table of the daily news, like you see, you know, we, this is probably one of the few sessions we talks about the Brexit EU, which is good news and not bad news. I was um, thinking it was refreshing to take a, a breath from the other. Yeah, side. I think it's good. <laughs> you know, the EU and the UK need some time now to come to a conclusion. It's a very tight time frame. Uh, if a hard Brexit still happens, it will be not as bad. But again, it's not a good idea in the first place. It will not be good for the UK nor for Europe in any case. But, you know, the citizens have, have chosen their, you know, their way and now we have to execute that somehow. How do you think about the different outcomes and how do you plan? Well, we have planned. I mean, we would be a bad institution if we wouldn't have planned for the outcome already last March. Um, so I think uh, the financial markets already gave the response. Uh, one big uncertainty kind of has been put now off the table with the risk remaining that potentially a deal is not happening at the end of the day. But you can see how the capital markets are reacting if things like the trade agreement between US and China, but also now the Brexit, seems to come to an end where you have a better certainty. And um, I can only encourage that what has been said by the commissioner and the minister, that uh, we use the time in its best possible way to find a, a fair agreement, because what we really need in Europe is a platform for growth. And in case uncertainty comes back, it plays badly on the UK, but also on Europe. And hopefully everybody understands that. We are already from a growth rate in Europe behind the regions in Asia, China, but also the US. And we have to make sure as Europeans that we do everything to actually accelerate growth. And for that, we need an agreement. I think certainty um, at least uh, came back. Now we have to use the time um, as per the suggestions which were made. And um, I think we are all in favor of having a fair agreement because at the end of the day, Europe can only be competitive if we stand um, with a clear stance and also have a, a good agreement. Well, we have the Commissioner for the Economy here. So what's the plan to get out of this sort of 1% growth trap beyond just making a deal with the UK? I would say uh, first in this moment, uh, I think that uh, the, the Green Deal uh, that was the first proposal of this new commission uh, and that in some way is giving to the new commission a, a profile. Uh, uh, this uh, Green Deal is for Europe 
uh, the, the main tool for, for new growth, frankly speaking, because um, uh, we, can, um, we can't overestimate the importance, the importance of this thing, because we are talking about changes in our way of housing, in our way of transport, in energy uh, sources, um, in food. So in, it is a changement, I think, that can remind us only uh, to what happened in the 50s and in the 60s, changement on the real life of hundreds of millions of people, if we are serious on this. And I think we will be serious because we, we are not only announcing a, pro, a program, we, we are not only mobilizing investments, but we are taking decision on regulation, we are taking decision on new rules for state aid, we are taking decision on taxation. And this whole uh, packet means uh, a chance for relaunch of our investments and of growth. Then this is not all we need. We need also uh, a review of our fiscal rules uh, to facilitate investments. I would say not only green investments, but in general investments future-proof. Investment for the future, investment for the digital innovation, and, and I would mention this as the second point. First point, the Green Deal. Second point, uh, to try to have a more coordinated and um, supportive uh, fiscal policy at EU level. We are now in a better situation than 10 years ago. Uh, we should always keep an eye on our high debt in some countries, but in general, we need a really supportive fiscal stance because monetary tools are no more sufficient. Uh, we can't imagine uh, to help growth only with monetary decisions. Uh, this was perhaps uh, extraordinarily useful in the last years, but now we need to join with our fiscal policies, monetary policy decisions. I think we're going to hear the exact same thing today from ECB President Christine Lagarde, who will be speaking soon at her news conference. <laughs> so is he saying that we need fiscal stimulus in Germany? I mean, doesn't everyone think that in the market? Why is that not happening? You know, you know fiscal stimulus is always, uh, you know, something which is demanded. You know, I think we have more fundamental problems we should tackle, which we never address, which is a reduction regulation. You know, I'm... I'm saying in, in Brussels, when I pe people there say always, you know, before you put a new regulation out, take two out. You get 100,000 pages with a small fund, but you can't write more pages than that. That would help significantly more. We, have, a, we have in our industry. Commission, it will not be easy to do it. No, I know that's not easy, but if you look but just for is, air traffic. The commitment traffic, is there. Air traffic control. We operate a lot of airplanes. You know, we have so fragmented air traffic control in Europe, which is nonsense. You know, it's not good for the environment. We have too many planes waiting on the, in front of a runway with running engines and all this kind of stuff, or circling in the air. You know, this is impossible to imagine that we get one air traffic control in Europe, which was would be a fantastic, nice thing for reduced costs. Brexit. If we don't get an amicable deal, we will increase the cost at the border with zero growth impact. It will be negative. It is just cost. There will be no stimulus. And that is all this, these regulations, you know, border control. If I go to developing countries, you know, the guys ask me, governments ask me, what would you do? I said three things. <coughs> invest in education, invest in infrastructure, and easy border access. That's it. If you do that right, your country will prosper. In Europe, we are talking about regulation this and regulation that and blah, blah. You know, I think the idea of carbon pricing is a great idea. We have to put a price ticket. Don't call it tax. Call it carbon price. But don't regulate which technology should solve a problem. And that is very often happening in Europe, that we say, we have an idea and we have also the solution, and that's wrong. Industry and science should solve the problem and not the regulator. The regulator should say, carbon is a price, fair enough, everybody has to pay the price, but the people who are more innovative have an advantage. Yes, uh, well, if I may, the, the mood in Brussels now is not to add regulation, not at all. The mood is... <laughs> he looks skeptical. 
Yes, but... Uh, I've, heard, I've heard that before. Uh, I, yes, but I can assure you. Uh, uh, the mood is, uh, on the contrary, on, on some uh, targeted issue, um, uh, to have an evolution uh, limiting some regulation. Uh, then we need, uh, obviously, uh, regulation uh, coherent with the Green Deal. You were mentioning the, the carbon uh, we call it the carbon adjustment mechanism, not to call it the carbon tax. <laughs> no, it's a price. Uh, it's, yes. yeah. it's a cost. It's a price, yes. Uh, and we need to, to evolve on some uh, taxation directives. But regulation will not be the core of this uh, new Green Deal for okay, you. Okay, we have a deal. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So. We just got a, a, a policy deal, I think. Um, a whole new approach to European That's regulation. It. Christian... Germany, I mean, that, that's been a big problem for European growth, right? Didn't we just come off a year of 0.6% growth, I thought I saw? The well, slowest let's let's in also year. be honest. I mean, we shouldn't always uh, criticize the home country. Uh, it was also the growth engine for a lot of years, right? So to put it in perspective. But <laughs> first of all, I'm so happy that an, not a banker is talking about deregulation, but I fully support uh, Frank Apple. I, I think it is, it is one of the reasons, by the way, why the U.S. is doing so well in economic growth, because... It is not only on the tax side, on the fiscal stimulus, it's actually the deregulation across industries. And I'm the first one who always said we needed more regulation in the banking system. But there are certain issues which are now too much. And if we are overdoing it, you actually stop the growth. And we have to be very careful with that. If we think about certain regulations on Basel III, Basel IV, we need to be careful what it means to the European financial markets. Now, Germany... I do think there is some room for fiscal stimulus, but we shouldn't do the mistake to do it too broadly. I think we need very specific items actually linked to the European agenda, i.e. to the Green Deal, to technology, where we think we have a competitive advantage. And if you really think about sustainability, if you really think about ESG, everybody's talking about the cost to it. There are huge costs. But if Europe is playing, is playing it the right way, and we have some fiscal stimulus with the support of the corporates and the institutions. It could be actually a gross potential. And if we define these buckets, I think we have a chance actually to accelerate growth um, and to benefit from it. And in this regard, uh, we can certainly think about um, some fiscal stimulus. Um, but just fiscal stimulus on its own is not the solution. Um, and hence, I think the balance between deregulation, defining the buckets, and last but not least, we had yesterday a session at the Deutsche Bank, um, uh, at the Deutsche Bank agenda point. We need a new narrative for Europe. People still see Europe as the project which brought peace to uh, that region, and that was a fantastic thing. We need now to explain our people for what Europe is standing, and you need to link deregulation agenda, the green, the green deal with a narrative, what it means for the people living in Europe and where our potential is. If we do this, I think there are great chances for this region. And I, maybe let me add on, on the stimulus, because, you know, you, know, and, and, you know, I'm not saying that because I'm a German and in favor of balanced budgets, but I'm somehow also a capitalist, which you can't say any longer. <laughs> and capitalism says that you, you should you not spend the money, or the tax money of a future generation. Yeah. Yeah, Germany still has two trillion you know, loans, you know, that's a lot of money the future, the kids have to pay in the future. So we are living at the moment not in a recession. You know, stimulus need is necessary in, in a recession. We are not in a recession. And, you know, and that's the point. We have still to bring these things and we are spending the money of the next generation. When youth is now out and right, you know, on carbon, it should be out as well. And why you are spending our money now? That's not fair. And that is, capitalism should can take money out of a system or the government should spend less in the moment that the economy is good and use the money. That has not taken place, neither in the US and Europe. Germany, it has a limit. If you read books of capitalists, they write, you have to put a limit on what you can spend. And Germany has that in their constitution now, which is right, which is actually capitalism thinking and not socialistic thinking or something, because we can't spend the money of the next generation. That's easy. It's, I'm saying that for me as a businessman, you are politicians. 
So for you, it's difficult because, of course, the people are living now and not in the future. But, <laughs> and therefore, stimulus is easy and it's not necessary because the, the economy is still growing. Well, it, I mean, it's an interesting dilemma for Italy, right? Because that is a high debt load country with very little economic growth. So how do you think about how to stimulate the growth picture? I think uh, that uh, I agree with the ECB and with the Commission that uh, we need a supportive fiscal stance. Uh, supportive uh, also because uh, if we, especially if we want that the monetary policy does not take alone the burden uh, of, uh, of avoiding deflation, on keeping uh, economy moving uh, and, and pushing for growth. So I think this is, uh, and, and actually a country which has uh, negative interest rates, uh, of course, this is also reasoning about the oh, burden we'll of that. future this generation uh, has to be put into perspective, of course. But, uh, but, but of course, I, I agree with the fact that it's not uh, just spending for spending that will solve our problem. I totally agree. And then I think what, what unites us in, in is, is one word, which is investments. So what we need, we have an investment gap. We have actually an investment gap. And if we measure this investment gap, not only with the average investment of before the crisis, but with the investment that would be needed to address our climate targets, to address our innovation challenges, looking what is happening around the world. We clearly need to mobilize an unprecedented amount of investments. It has to be public investments. Of course, we cannot do this with public investment. We have limited fiscal space, and some country, like Italy, has particularly more limited fiscal space, and we are aware of that. That's why we, we, we have a prudent fiscal policy. We, we keep our debt on a declining path. But still, of course, we need also a creative, uh, original, innovative way of combining public resources, supply of private resources, invest in Juncker plan is, is, is a perfect way. You, you can use uh, your budget money or national money to crowd in, to help mobilize, to de-risk private investment, especially if you want to channel those investments where they are more needed and where they might be beginning a more marginal high cost reducing emission, but then a long-term gain, uh, also not only for climate, but also for productivity and growth. So that's the pact, the deal that we have to do to mobilize the unprecedented amount of private and public investment, channeling through climate change uh, issues and innovation. I would like to call it European Green Innovation Deal. That, for me, would be the perfect formula. And these are, these are the two frontiers we have, we have to address. And to do that, and investment, you know, are good for aggregate demand, but are good for, for potential growth and supply side. That's what we need. And I think this is kind of the, the, the approach also the Commission has put in this, is a Green New Deal. And as I said, we are mobilizing 1, 000, uh, 1 trillion investment in the next year, but they know this is not enough. Only if you want to reach the old targets, you need more. And if you, if you want to arrive to, to climate, to, to emission neutrality by 2050, if you want to, to, uh, to, to enable our manufacturing uh, system, to, to, not to lose the race of innovation, artificial intelligence. We really need extraordinary investment. That's what we want to do from the Italian side, but being protagonist uh, of, a, of a European green innovation deal. And that's a common challenge and uh, what we are to do a strong pact between public policy and business community. Meantime, monetary policy has been the main game in town. Christian, how do you feel about negative interest rates? <laughs> Well, I said it all. Um, uh, obviously, I, again, it was the right measure right after the euro crisis. I think the ECB has done a good job in safeguarding the Europe and also safeguarding euro, the euro and safeguarding Europe as it all. We shouldn't discuss that. I personally think we missed the exit because at some point in time you need to leave this, this uh, path of negative interest rates and we are now at a point where the monetary policy is coming to, to its limits. But forget about the impacts for the banks, which is significant. But for that, we adjusted our business model. You have seen our restructuring, other banks restructured. We have to do it. We have to deal with that. Otherwise, I would be a bad manager. Forget that. The real long-term impact on the society is the issue we have to talk about. There is not a big majority, if at all a majority, in Germany of people who have access to the cheap money. And when I talk about that, I mean cheap money in terms of mortgage financings. 
That means the disparity between those people who benefit from this kind of monetary policy to those people who have no benefit at all, actually they are losing money with the savings we have, is getting bigger and bigger. And that is getting a kind of a, in my view, a political problem. And hence, I really do think we need to think broader when we talk about the monetary policy, not only obviously the impact on us, which is not good if we compare ourselves to the US banks. Think about the liquidity reserves European banks have with minus 0.5% versus the liquidity reserves of the US banks getting positive interest. It's huge, it makes a huge difference. But the real issue is the long-term impact on society. And therefore, I think we need a pass and I have great respect for that, uh, I think, what the new administration the ECB is saying. They're reviewing the strategy. I'm not expecting a short-term, complete turnaround. But I think there is a very constructive thought process. What does it actually mean to all parts of the society? And therefore, I'm confident that we hopefully see the one or the other change but we have to leave the negative interest in particular for the society. It's interesting, you know, President Trump just here in Davos a few days ago said, Europe has negative interest rates, there you have a competitive advantage, and that he said he could get used to negative interest rates. Is he right? <laughs> uh, well, I think it's up to the ECB to, to take the decisions on this. Uh, what I would stress is, uh, that in fact we can't leave the ECB alone uh, on the perspective of uh, our economy. This um, was true in the last uh, two or three years. Uh, we are no more in the situation we were in, in 2012, 2013, and unfortunately uh, not only our fiscal rules but Frequently, also, our mindset is uh, still to the mindset we had uh, during the deep crisis. Yes, we were risking default in some countries. We were even risking the currency at that time. But now this is no more the case. Uh, this doesn't mean that we uh, will spend money just to spend money. I agree perfectly with you. Uh, we need targeted spending. But this is not something that, again, the e ECB could solve alone. Uh, we can't risk a, a new uh, double-dip uh, crisis. Though you have restricted uh, uh, policies, monetary policies, uh, influencing negatively the situation. We need, I think, I think uh, to have a selective and concentrated fiscal policy helping monetary policy. Uh, Frankly, I don't think that this is uh, capitalist or socialist. I, I don't think that uh, Japanese are, 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 are socialists. They have a very high level of debt. It depends on the uh, circumstances. What is sure is that in this moment, EU has a rather low level of public debt on average. Uh, both the EU, 7, 76%, and the euro area, 84, 85 percent of public debt. It's a rather low public debt. So no general spending, uh, caution uh, on countries with high level of debt, but we need on education, innovation, and especially the Green Deal, a new effort. You were mentioning the importance of a new narrative. I think that the Green Deal is part of a new narrative. Uh, if I ask my uh, wife what is mm, the EU, well, a little bit she knows, but um, <laughs> in this moment she would, should answer the Green Deal. Uh, this is uh, defining EU profile. I would like also to add something. I, I would like very much to have from EU a geopolitical profile um, for multilateralism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and we should work on this. But uh, please don't think that a new, uh, a changement in ECB policies uh, could solve all our problems. Nobody is saying this, but I think we should be very clear that we have to do our part of the job with our uh, fiscal policies and coordinating them. Yeah, may, may let me add because you know, I, you know, I'm not sure what is really right because it's such, such a difficult matter. I think it would be good if we start at least calling 
the negative interest of a hidden tax, what it is actually. Uh, because they, the governments are benefiting massively from the negative interest rates. So why are they are not giving that delta back to the citizens? Because it's a t hidden tax which nobody calls like that. But it is what it is, because you know, there is an arbitrage now. And the budgets are getting better because the governments are benefiting from that massively to pay less interest rates. Uh, and like who, pays a bill, who pays a bill are the citizens. So that's the reason why I'm calling it a hidden tax. And I think that's, if we start with that language, you know, then we will probably get to different conclusions on what's going on. Yeah, but maybe we need, we need also to make the right question. So why uh, in Europe they are lower, for instance, than the US? And the answer is very easy. If you compare the fiscal stance of the US to the one of the Europe in the last 10 years, you see exactly the, the answer to the question why we have lower interest rate in the US, because they had a fiscal stimulus. And uh, unless they became a socialist country, I don't think so. In the, uh, so they did a uh, quite a capitalist way approach, but they had the fiscal stimulus after the crisis. So they relaunched growth, and so they can have higher interest rate. So the, my, my, my question to my friends when, uh, it, when, when we have this discussion, it is always, so why, how can one be at the same time uh, uh, against the low interest rate but against also the only way to make them grow. Because one of the two, I guess, so and I'm the first, I would be the most happiest person if we could have not, we could not need uh, for, for price stability uh, an, an, such an accommodative fiscal uh, monetary policy. And the ECB itself is saying, please help us not to have to do this, uh, but then uh, we are not able even to coordinate our fiscal stance and to channel also our fiscal policy in the area which are more, let's say, growth friendly, uh, productivity friendly, again, not just a stimulus for a stimulus, then again, we risk being. Then, having said that, I am the first to recognize that we would not solve all our problem, our structural uh, problem uh, with, with, with more fiscal, fiscal uh, stimulus, because some of these issues are more deeper. Uh, this is a demographic trends, uh, technological changes. So, indeed, we need a unique policy mix uh, where some essential structural reform are needed, some deepening of our integration, including financial integration across the EU, is essential. And fiscal policy should be uh, strongly connected, and what this Commission is going, doing is essential, connecting also the way in which we'll coordinate our fiscal policy to our broader goals, which is exactly climate change, innovation, so to see how also our targeted stimulus of a more favorable treatment for investment could be linked to the kind of investment we actually need to get our goals. And that's, I think, the new policy framework that I think Europe should gradually establish in order to, I mean, address this unique situation and also uh, the great opportunity that we have to be the number one in sustainability, the number one in innovation, and relaunching growth also on the basis of our unique social model, which is a social model based on cohesion of united societies, which are more resilient. And, 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 and so I think that that's a challenge we have. And uh, again, this uh, uh, stakeholder approach and the idea of a, of a big pact between public policy at national level, EU level, and business community is essential. If we go in the right direction, we can have different views. But if we define common goals and missions, I think we can get them. Well, Europe has to work it out internally. Europe has to work it out with the UK. And Europe has to work it out with the US. President Trump also made it clear that his next target on trade is Europe. And he wants to see a deal. And he threatened just this week that if we don't get it, there'll be new taxes, new tariffs on the auto sector. Frank, what would that do to the very small economic growth that Europe is already producing. You know, that, you know, any tariffs are not good for anybody anyway, uh, because you can see that around the world tariffs are avoidable cost at the end of the day. It will add costs to everybody, and that will be neither good for the US nor for Europe uh, long term or midterm even. So that is not good news. Would know. it push Europe into recession? Uh, no. I don't think so.
And that is also not in the interest of the U.S. So what, what, why should be the U.S. interested to have Europe in a recession? What would be better than for the U.S.? They will not send more products in Europe if Europe is in a recession. So I think there is no interest of the U.S. He's, he's called himself tariff man. Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the point is, again, tariffs are, tariffs are ex cost which are not adding value. It's cost which consumers have to pay finally. And so you I, can see that. I, I agree with Frank. I, I think it wouldn't put Europe into a recession. But it's the next wake-up call that we need to have a more integrated Europe in terms of how we integrate our industries, how we integrate uh, regulation. Like in the, we always talk about the banking union, but there is so much integration we need to do in the servicing industries that it's easier for us to actually serve out of one home country, be it from Germany or from Italy, into other European countries. We need to finally understand that whether it's the US, China or Asia, that each country in Europe is too small to compete on itself. And therefore, we need to work on an integrated Europe in order to have at least a competitive approach to the other two big regions. I want to open it up to the room, actually. Yeah, maybe, maybe add something, because we're always talking too much about what, how negative all these kind of things is and what, whatsoever, you know, what Chavez might mean for Europe. We should start talking more in Europe about what we can do our own. The Green Plan is a step in that direction. You know, for most social or society problems, we have somewhere in Europe a good solution. You know, they're not for every problem, but for many we have a good solution. So the Commission should look into that and say, let's doc, uh, a, a copy a good solution we have for housing, for education, for carbon um, uh, costs and all those kinds. Of we have a good solution. We are reinventing constantly the solution because the ministers or prime ministers are saying our country is slightly different. You know, we should focus on what we are good at. We have a lot of good solutions in Europe, and we should just deploy them consistently. And we should not always worry about what others are doing. We should worry what we are doing, and that's the opportunity. We still have the best education system on the world, on average. We still have the best infrastructure on average in the world. We have less inequality than in the rest of the world. So we should build on that and look, you know, what can we do as Europe to do that and not worry always what terrorists might come and this might happen. You know, we should focus on our own strengths and we have a lot of strength. And that will be the right roadmap and not always worrying about what others yeah. are doing. We have power. You know, we are strong and I'm a proud European. We have a lot of power and I'm living here because not, it is, it's, a bad, it's a great place to live. To live. We're changing the narrative right here, right now. A um, few minutes left. Definitely want to open it up to our great audience here, even though I could go on. Anybody with a question? I'll pick it up, if not. How's Deutsche Bank doing? <laughs> Very good. Uh, you'll see me smiling. So um, I always said this is a, a big transformation, which was needed. And I think we are off to a good start. Where are we in that transformation? <laughs> I don't get to interview you, so, you know so we have, you know, uh, I know, on TV, I know. so here we, we do go. It, we do it after the uh, annual results next week, so let's focus on Europe now. Oh, okay, <laughs> quite How's the Italian banking system doing? Uh, quite better. Uh, we have, uh, in terms of capital liquidity now, very good level, but also in terms of asset quality, uh, the MPL, uh, process of reduction MPL has moved very, very well. It is a success story. It has recognized everywhere, so we are... We are getting close also to go below 3% net in 2021. So we are on track even before uh, the, the plan. So I think uh, also it did help also the more attention at the EU level. The single supervisor helped the new regulation we contributed to define and also strong commitment by the whole banking sector and also some innovative tools we introduced like the GACs. So we have... Uh, this side of the asset quality, which is essential at the European level. Eh? This is not just MPL, of course, it's, it's a broader issue, but is uh, is key. And I'm confident now, thanks also to the new, in this case also, regulation we introduced after the crisis, we have a more resilient, stable EU banking uh, system. But now we have to push for integration. That's the point. So uh, we are not exploiting uh, the, the, the potentiality of having a banking union, uh, a cross-border banking system. So, of course, we need diversity, different banking models, some more local. We need to, I mean, ensure an environment where different difference, which is 
key of uh, EU identity remains uh, the safeguarded, but also we need to boost uh, more financial integration, removing this limitation for the more efficient use of capital liquidity across the banking union, completing the banking union with a common deposit guarantee system, completing now what we are doing with the backstop. So, and that would give a lot of potential uh, if, we, if we go beyond the, the fragmentation that was a bit uh, reintroduced after the financial crisis. So we have great potential and I'm confident because uh, the, 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 the overall the, 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 the banking system in Europe and in Italy is sound and solid, is ready to the challenge. We do have some questions back here. Yes, hi, uh, Phil Aldrich from The Times. I just wanted to ask a bit more about Brexit. Um, you mentioned that there's more clarity now that the uh, political situation in, in the UK is, uh, is more stable. Does this mean we're going to have a year in which we're, people are bullish, uh, companies are bullish about the UK? Do you think there's going to be a flood of investment going into the UK? Is Deutsche Bank going to you know, make, beef up its staff in the UK? I mean, is it, is it going to be a good year for the UK? Look, um First of all, I think uh, it is too early to say everybody is fully bullish now. Exactly what Frank is saying, I think it was a step into the right direction. Now we need to find out um, how the uh, trade deal is, is really finalized. And there is still a risk that it's not finalized. So I wouldn't say that uh, people are going all in um, from, a, from a risk return. That might be uh, the wrong call. So they wait for, for the uh, uh, future development. But I think what has been done now and, and the clarity and the certainty which has been given over the last uh, um, six weeks is for sure pointing into the right direction. For Deutsche Bank, we always said that the UK will be for us a material and very important <coughs> location. I think London will always be one of the key capital markets. And therefore, um, we adjust it in a way um, that we will have a significant uh, uh, location and place over there. Um, obviously, we prepared for kind of the worst, um, uh, for a kind of a breakup last year already, so that we could do everything out of Frankfurt. Um, that has been done. We had to do this. But we believe um, that, um, A, there will be an agreement. And I certainly believe that London will be a very important capital market, and Deutsche Bank will play its role there. So, you know, we have a big footprint in the UK, 50,000 employees, and we are working with a lot of companies. They have not changed their mind yet because the uncertainty is still there. So we have not seen a change. We see a change in China because there is now a flaw. We don't have a flaw yet for the UK because there is still the risk of a hard Brexit. And that's the reason why companies are delaying. And that's a part of all these tariffs discussion. The tariffs are not as bad as they might appear. The, the uncertainty is the problem because the uncertainty delays capital investments, and that delays growth. And we see that. We are measuring uh, the connectedness of the world, and what we have seen in 18, which are the, le le the last available data, what we have seen is not a reduction in trade, not a reduction in information flow, not a reduction in people flow, a reaction in capital flow. And that is a problem. Uncertainty puts pressure on capital investments, and we see the same in the UK. We have not reached the flaw. The, the first step of the trade, between, trade deal between China and US is that we have now a flaw, which gives certainty, even if we have not the second step. And that's different for still the Brexit case. And that's the reason why I'm not optimistic that our customers will invest a lot. And we only follow our customers. So we are not, can build just empty warehouses and say, great to have an empty warehouse. We need customers who are using them. And we don't see a lot of activity, unfortunately, at the moment. I think we have one, time for just one more. Yes, two questions. <coughs> the first to our uh, German friends. Uh, do you think that the banking union will be finished um, within the end of the year? Because, of course, Germany <laughs> is one of the ones who is opposing to that. And the second to all the speakers, do you think that uh, it is worthy to revise also the EU competition policy? So having uh, the possibility to have... Uh, uh, bigger companies in Europe uh, competing with the giants in China and US all over? I'm happy to answer the second. You can ask Chris. <laughs> Chris you can answer the well, first. Um, I answer first to of the all, second. You <laughs> do. <laughs> You know, I'm, I, 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 was, uh, I was on record. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the banking union. I think it's definitely needed for Europe. Um, look at the competition we have uh, from overseas. But you know what? With the biggest optimism I have, finishing it by the year end, 20, not doable. But if we can set the right tone and move into the right direction, 
Uh, I'm hopeful that we can finish it uh, over the next two to three years. That is important uh, for Europe, but we should be realistic. Uh, within 12 months' time, even under a German uh, president uh, for the EU in the second half, I think it won't happen. I, I believe, uh, you know, we are a European champion and we are a global player. <coughs> and, and that is a strength of our company because we are present everywhere and can benefit. Uh, I think we need, and that's industry by industry. So in the train industry, yes, we need a European player. The problem is I can't blame the Commission because the law currently doesn't allow. So the Commission has rightly decided following the law. So the law has to be changed to allow that. And so therefore, you can't criticize anybody because the law is currently what it is. I think it would be, had been better. We are very proud of Airbus in Europe, and that was a, the same decision, and that's right. And we need that for certain industry. We have by far too many telecoms. So the, the US is dealing with going down from four to three, potentially, or you know, we are dealing with whatever, <coughs> 30 or 40. That is not efficient. That generates additional cost, which makes Europe less competitive. Uh, Very quickly, because oh, I think things. we're almost out of time. Uh, timing of the banking union. The, the German finance minister is uh, saying that we need two years to, uh, to shape a potential agreement and five years to put it in place. Okay. Uh, so this is two a... Two plus three, so five. Two, two. plus three. Uh, this is, I think, a rather rational uh, timing. Uh, second, um, I think we need... And by the way, the, the communication I, I presented and the Commission approved uh, 10 years ago about the investment plan and the Green Deal uh, already says that we will change some rules on competition on targeted areas connected to the Green Deal. Uh, and this is something relevant for the EU uh, way of life, as you know. Uh, on, at the same time, uh, I think that we can't kill our general competition framework, which is, in fact, successful. Uh, I mention only the fact that one of the most successful books uh, nowadays in the US is a book of a French economist about the successful model of uh, competition in the European economy. So we had good things and uh, bad things. We should change in the targeted and right places our rules without uh, mm, disrupting our competition model, which was at least at the end successful. Did you have a final point? Do you want to, you want to take us out on an optimistic I, note? I fully agree with what Paolo said, so I <laughs> not, will be particularly lively to repeat that. But, uh, but in some area, we need really to update our framework, which just means competition, but also state aid and what we are doing also on the factories, on, 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 on targeted process where we need also uh, to allow more support from, 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 from the state to, to crowd in private capital and, 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 and address our challenge of also our competitors around the world. At the same time, uh, our framework is, is robust and uh, is also guarantee for everybody. So because we are a broad union, and we need also to avoid that uh, there is an uh, unfair, unlevel playing field within the union. But at the same time, we need to know that in some markets, the markets are global. And we cannot just count the participants within the union and then discover there are four or five across the globe. Because that's, you really prevent yourself to be competitive. So it's a really difficult balance. But uh, I think we are on a way to finally do these targeted uh, improvements, both in the area of competition and in the area of state aid. And uh, I think in, in the framework of our innovation policy and uh, green policy, that would be necessary and appropriate. It sounds like you all have your work cut out for you in 2020. Thank you.